Um, so, uh, what we found at Ocado using simulations in this way uh, is that better testing and debugging capabilities speeds up development uh, as well as decreasing the frequency of production issues. Uh, we have a bit of a hard time convincing people that better testing actually speeds up development, but if you think about the amount of time you spend debugging issues, if you can speed up that process, then you can actually produce a solution faster. Uh, so it's something that project managers sometimes struggle to accept, but we've been trying to push for that a bit more here. Um, We've also found that better analysis and optimization uh, capabilities results in a better system, both in terms of the physical system uh, and the software that runs it. Um, and uh, we've found that discrete event simulation can help you get to these goals. Um, so uh, just out of interest, how many of you are familiar with simulation? Yeah, okay, so we've got not many people that have worked with simulations before. Uh, and in terms of simulations then, uh, are they sort of real-time simulations or discrete event simulations that you've worked with? Do you know? I guess it, I was thinking about other kind of simulations. Okay. Stops and walks. Right, okay, yeah, sure, yeah. Like that. Yeah, fair enough, okay. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about discrete event simulation, which is sort of full application level simulation. Uh, so if we go on to that and just talk about what a discrete event simulation is. Um, so. Uh, one thing that it is, is a mechanism that can be used to deterministically run a system against simulated components faster than real time. So those two aspects are the main features of a discrete event simulation, that it's deterministic uh, and it's faster than real time. Uh, so a discrete event simulation loop might look like this. So uh, we set the clock, set the system clock to the time of the next event and process that event. Uh, processing that event might then schedule further events. Uh, and we'll then repeat that loop, so we'll ex uh, jump to the time of the next event, execute that event, jump to the time of the next event, and execute that event. Uh, so if we just go over a simple uh, visual demonstration of what that might look like, so we've got uh, a timeline there with time progressing from left to right. Uh, the program starts uh, at the beginning. Uh, we've got some events that are already scheduled uh, for particular points in time, and in a discrete event simulation, the program will jump from one point in time to another point in time and execute an event like that. So it's now executing event one. Executing event one has scheduled another event. So uh, event four appeared over here. Uh, and then it will jump to the time of the next event and execute it, jump to the time of the next event and execute it and so on. If we contrast that with a real-time simulation or how a real production system might work, so if you've scheduled some events in a, in a real production system, you don't expect the clock to just jump to them and execute them. You expect it to actually take a second to uh, get to the event. So that might look something like this, where the program is proceeding linearly locked to the time and executing events as it interacts with them. Uh, did that make sense? Just stop there and make sure that everyone's yeah, happy with that concept. Okay, uh, so we've got a simple example then. Um, so if we take a physical queue, you could, uh, you could envisage a queue where people are queuing for a counter or something like that. Uh, each person joins the queue at a random, amount, uh, a random time. Uh, these times might be scheduled up front. Uh, upon reaching the head of the queue, they take a certain amount of time to be served. Uh, and then leave the queue. Uh, and each time that someone leaves the queue, we can schedule another event for the next person to be served. Uh, so these events are then processed in time order on the scheduler in a loop, and that means that we will jump from event to event and not sleep, which might mean that we can simulate a certain amount of time uh, in much less time than that. Uh, so if we have a visual uh, look at what that might look like for a queue, uh, so we've got over here our list of events, which is currently empty, and our shop counter that people will be queuing for. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is schedule some events. Uh, so we'll schedule the arrival of the first person for five seconds time, and that will add this event to the events queue. Can people see that okay? Just checking the resolution's not too low. Yeah, cool. Uh, so we'll then schedule the arrival of the second person for six seconds time and add that to the events queue. And then we'll jump to five seconds time to execute that first event. And then we'll execute it. So we've executed that event, someone's now arrived. Uh, and this will then schedule the departure of this person. Uh, so this, is, this event here is now the first person leaving. Uh, we'll then jump to the time of the next event, so that'll jump to six seconds uh, and process the next event, which is this, this guy arriving here. Uh, and that will schedule his departure. And then we'll jump to the next event and execute that. And we'll jump to the next event and execute that. Um, so 
And that was a sort of demonstration of how a very simple discrete event simulation might work uh, where we're jumping in time. So we simulated eight seconds of time there and it took me a lot longer to actually describe how that worked but you can think of that as us uh, running through the program. Actually that's not a great model of a queue because we scheduled the second person's departure based on his arrival rather than waiting for the constraint of the first person getting out of the way but that's a more complicated uh, demo that wouldn't fit on the slides there. Uh, so if we look at a more complex example, uh, it could be something like uh, Ocado's warehouse, which I've got a little uh, video for you here. If that will load, please load. Oh no, I've got no internet connection. Okay, uh, well let's just have a look at the still image then and ignore that video. Uh, so, thanks Windows. Sorry, bear with me for one second. Okay, now my whole thing is offline, so I can't even go into present mode anymore. Let's try this again. It's the great thing about using Google Slides for conference talks. Limited. Okay, uh, right. Okay, well, I'll have to do the rest of this not... Oh, oh, no, we're back. We're back. Okay, good stuff. Might even mean we can look at the video. Yes, it does. Excellent. Uh, so, this is uh, a video of a visualization of the simulation of an Ocado warehouse. Uh, so, you can see lots of blue containers flying around on pieces of conveyor in the warehouse. That's taking goods from one part of the warehouse to another. Um, so, in terms of the simulation part, we've simulated the physical mechanics of the actual conveyors and we've simulated the containers moving around on them and we've simulated the little stick men that are actually taking goods out of the container putting it into other containers, that sort of thing um, and on top of that is actually running production code that's actually controlling things like uh, where containers should actually move to so it's providing the routing instructions to do a sort of traffic management system on top of those simulated physical components so that's us testing production code against a simulation and visualising it uh, and that's actually a discrete event simulation, so what we're watching here is a playback that's in real time, but that actually took much less than that amount of time to simulate. Uh, so that's a more sort of complicated example of a discrete event simulation. Uh, if we move on and think about some software engineering challenges that this can help us with then. So in terms of testing, uh, we want to have high confidence that our systems do what they should do. We want to uh, identify why they're not doing what they should do uh, quickly. We want to analyse uh, how our system's performing uh, or will perform, so it might be a predictive thing rather than a live production analysis. Uh, and we want to optimise our system, so we want to make them perform better for some definition of better. So how can discrete event simulation help with that then? So on the testing front, um, you can use discrete event simulation to give you scenario testing uh, which is much like uh, jbehave. If, uh, I don't know if any of you use jbehave or something similar. Yeah, okay, we've got one jbehave user there. Um, on top of that, though, we can use it to give full production case testing. So the visualization that we just saw was uh, not a scenario test. That was a full production case test where we're running a full uh, production day's worth of data through our simulation model. And this sort of soak testing can uncover all sorts of rare edge cases that you might not have thought about. In scenario testing you have to have thought of the edge case that you want to test, whereas in SOAP testing you just throw tons of data at your simulation and let it find your rare edge cases for you. And it's those sort of rare edge cases that we find, if you don't have this sort of SOAP testing, are more likely to slip through your testing and end up in, in production incidents. So uh, one aspect of these tests, of both scenario testing and the full production case testing, is that they can be deterministic. And so that's something that jbehave doesn't necessarily give you, uh, which means that each time you execute a test, it will produce exactly the same result. It will execute the exact same code path. Um, so that means that you then don't get any false alarms. If your test passes, it's always going to pass for that version of your code. And if it fails, it's always going to fail for that version of your code. Uh, we find that that deterministic aspect of these tests is massively important uh, for being able to uh, have a decent CI process that you can rely on. When it's green, you know that it's green. When it's red, you don't just rerun it and hope that it turns green again. Uh, we can also use determinism uh, to 
uh, add another property to these tests. So um, because we can use random in either our simulation or our production system, uh, we might be able to then use different random seeds to produce chaos in our system. And that means we can run the same scenario with lots of different random seeds and increase our test coverage that way. So it might be, for example, in our uh, conveyor simulation, we might model some discrepancy in the amount of time that it takes for a container to move from one place to another. Uh, so that random amount of time means that if we then seed the system differently, containers will take slightly longer to get places, which might mean that then the production system decides to route them slightly differently, decides to send them down different paths. Um, so we can use that to uh, create wildly different uh, outcomes, but the same uh, scenario that you're actually exercising. So that's Monte Carlo testing. Another aspect of these tests is that they can run faster than real time. Uh, so an hour of production code can be executed in less than an hour. Exactly how much less depends on the complexity of your simulation and the complexity of your production code. So I think the, uh, the visualization that we just looked at was something like four times faster than real time, which is actually not all that fast in terms of discrete event simulation. It's a lot faster than waiting for uh, the real time equivalent, but uh, we have other simulations that can run much faster than that. So it depends as to what sort of uh, level you can abstract to. If you can abstract more of the physical mechanics, then you can get a simulation that will run faster, but you might have a lower fidelity model. So it's something that you can sort of pick and choose as to how uh, much fidelity you put in your model. Um, tests can also model pseudo-random or pre-configured execution delays. So we can use this to flush out concurrency issues. So for example, we might have um, a part of our code that is responsible for handling a request and producing a response asynchronously. Uh, by default, in a discrete event simulation, everything is going to take zero time to execute, because we, we can allow it to take as much real time to execute as we want, but we haven't advanced the system clock. So it's effectively still stuck on that same time point. But what we can do is schedule the response from uh, asynchronous calls like that uh, to then flush out issues to say, if we always take a second to produce this response and some other calculations have happened in the meantime, are there race conditions there? Uh, so that means that we can then deterministically debug concurrency issues. Uh, so just a, a bit more on debugging then. Uh, so because we've got that deterministic property, uh, we can let CI find our test failures and then exactly reproduce them locally. Uh, so we can just push code to Jenkins on our branch. Thanks. Uh, we can uh, let it run our tests and we can know that we can take any failures that it's producing and run them locally in a debug session and get the same outcome. Uh, so we can add breakpoints and logging around the point where the test fails. Uh, and once we've then uncovered some information about that failure, uh, one thing that's really important with a discrete event simulation is we can then breakpoint an earlier point in that execution. So we might de be debugging something about why a container ended up at the wrong location in our conveyor system. Uh, why it got there is the product of several upstream decisions. And normally, if you've got a non-deterministic application, you can't really easily debug that, because each time you rerun it, it might be a different container that arrives in the wrong place. It might be a different wrong place that it arrives at. But if you've got a deterministic system, you can say, all right, I'll just breakpoint the point where we decided for container 5 to go to output 7, and I know that I will get to the exact same point in the execution. So that's really powerful for debugging. Uh, and again, because the test is faster than real time, we can get to that breakpoint a lot quicker than we could in a real time uh, run. So in terms of analysis then, so uh, our discrete event simulations can output statistics about how our system's performing. Uh, so for our warehouse example, that might be uh, how fast do we pick products, uh, how, uh, what, what's the sort of rate of conveyor uh, flow, so how many containers are we putting through a particular piece of conveyor. Uh, we can then use these sorts of statistics for business planning purposes. So we can tell the business uh, actually running this system with these inputs will uh, give us this throughput, therefore you're going to make this amount of profit or uh, you'd need to employ this many picking staff to actually do the pick process. Um, and we can also tell them things like how much peak load we can handle with these inputs. Um, and then we can use Monte Carlo sweeps to give us more statistical confidence about these results. So we can run the same experiment over and over with different random seeds, uh, get the same statistics, calculate the mean throughputs or, or whatever metric we're looking at, uh, look at the standard deviation and things like that and see exactly how reliable we think these measures are. 
The other thing about the analysis is if we implement statistics in the production code that we're testing rather than the simulation that's used to test it, uh, we can use these same statistics in production. Uh, so that's useful because we might want to look at uh, what the throughput is in production anyway, so we could feed that into reporting and things like that. Uh, it's also useful to verify that your simulation is behaving uh, accurately to real life. Uh, so if you've got a massive discrepancy between what we predicted might happen and what actually happened, then we know that our simulation isn't actually very accurate. It's not giving us much value as a predictive engine. Um, we might be able to identify why and then correct our simulation model. And another thing, so this is one of my team's main focus, uh, is optimization of uh, things like warehouse systems. Um, and we can use the statistics that these simulations generate to actually optimize the systems that we're building, both in terms of the physical system and the software. Uh, so if we're generating throughput statistics, we can change the inputs to our system. Uh, so that could be things like uh, different warehouse layouts, uh, different physical devices, different properties of the physical devices. So what if, it, what if the conveyors all ran a bit faster? Uh, we can then figure out how much gain that gives us and inform business decisions. So they might want to do uh, quantitative advice uh, to inform investment decisions. We might want to choose one of two physical devices to actually build. Uh, so that's one use of the optimization. Uh, another use of uh, statistics for optimization is in terms of informing algorithmic decisions. So we might have multiple competing algorithms in our warehouse. We might have different uh, container routing strategies around our conveyors. Uh, and we might want to pick which one's best. And in order to pick which one's best, we can run the simulation with each of those algorithms uh, and see which one gives us a, a better outcome and use Monte Carlo testing to give us a reliable answer. And again, we can uh, tune config. So if we've got one algorithm that's maybe cost function based and we've got different cost coefficients that we can tweak, so how important is one factor versus another factor in your cost function, uh, we can run many, many simulations with lots of different values of all of those bits of configurations um, and see which configuration gives us the best outcome and then use that to feed into our production system and actually run the warehouse in the most optimal way. But we do have a few limitations in discrete event simulation. So we can't easily test network interfaces because we're in control of how events are scheduled and how, how we actually execute the program. We can't easily test the network interface, but we can test all the way down to the serialization layer, which is sort of most of your application, but not the very edge of it. We can't test actually running in real time, so there will be uh, certain aspects of running in real time that you won't see in a discrete event simulation. So in Java lands, that might be garbage collections. You don't see your system just pause for a bit. You can model those sorts of things if you want. So you can, you can insert events to just say, take this amount of time and block all of the other events. Uh, but uh, there will be certain, certain aspects of real time that you won't easily be able to model in a discrete event simulation. Um, but we can test certain threading issues, like we mentioned before, where we can uh, insert artificial delays on the responses of uh, certain function calls. We can't incorporate some third-party libraries. So uh, if the libraries are non-deterministic, we could incorporate them, but then we'd lose the determinism of the whole simulation, which would be a lot less valuable for us. Uh, or it could be that the library handles its own threading, so it does its own scheduling, uh, unless we can hook into that and. Uh, put in our own scheduling framework inside that library, it might mean that we need to uh, mock out that library and replace it with our own overridden bit of code that just feeds directly into the simulation. Uh, so uh, at Ocado, we've had to uh, tinker with the internal code for ACA to make it be able to support discrete event simulation. Uh, the thing about discrete event simulations, though, is that you can actually reuse most of the code to produce real-time simulations. Uh, so all you really need to do is change the scheduler implementation and the time provider implementation. So how we queue up things for execution and how we tell what the time is, uh, as well as that networking interface. Um, so that will then allow us to do real-time simulations, which fill all of the gaps that discrete event simulations can't cover. These real-time simulations, though, sacrifice determinism and faster than real-time nature. Uh, so uh, it's much better, if possible, to test with discrete event simulations where you can, and then just use real-time simulations to cover the bits that you can't cover in discrete event simulation. So let's have a little talk about building a discrete event simulation now, then. Uh, so uh, we'll need an event scheduler. So that's the mechanism that we use to queue up events for execution. 
and we'll need a time provider, which is how we can tell what the current time in the simulation is. And that's all we actually need to build a discrete event simulation. But we want to make sure it runs deterministically. Uh, so to do that, we also need to make sure we write the simulation code in a way that avoids any non-deterministic operations. So that could be uh, calls to unseeded random number generators or uh, non-deterministic iterations. So for example, hash sets. If you just have a hash set of objects uh, and haven't overridden the hash code, each time you run it, you'll get iteration based on the memory address, which is effectively random. Uh, but as long as we pay attention to that, we should be able to build a deterministic simulation. Um, so the event scheduler interface might look something like that, uh, where we can do uh, this runnable uh, at a particular time. So a very simple uh, interface into an event scheduler. Uh, if we then have a look, can you guys see that okay? A bit too small. Ah, I don't think I can blow that up very easily. Okay, I'll just talk about that. So if we, uh, if we have a discrete event simulation, uh, we need a discrete event scheduler that takes a runnable and builds an event object that wraps the runnable that you want to execute and the time that you want to execute it. Yeah, turning off the light sounds a good idea, if you wouldn't mind, cheers. Ooh. Yeah, is that better? Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, so, uh, all right, so we can hopefully now see this. So we're, we're passing in a runnable, we're wrapping the runnable and the time in an event, and we're adding that event to this tree set of events, and that's just ordered by the time that we want to execute each of the events. Um, we then execute them uh, by polling the first event, setting the time in the time provider to the time of the next event, and executing it. Uh, so you can see we've got no sleep in here. It will execute all of the events uh, one after the other and jump time in between. So you might schedule them uh, days apart, but it will still execute them immediately. If we contrast that with uh, what we'd need for a real-time uh, simulation or real-time production application, uh, we could have uh, an executor-based event scheduler uh, that has a scheduled executor service. Uh, and each time we ask for a runnable to be done at a particular time, uh, it can just call through to that scheduled executor service, passing it that runnable. So that will then happen the actual delay uh, apart from now. So we, we're taking in the time that we want to execute the event, the current time from the time provider. So it's that delay that will then actually execute that event in. So that will sleep in between events. So the other thing we need to look at then is the time provider. So it might look something like that, where we've just got a very simple thing that can allow us to get the current time. Uh, in discrete event, we might have one that just wraps uh, a double that it stores, uh, and we need to be able to set it from the discrete event scheduler. So we've got a little set function that just sets the current time, and get time just returns that value. And we might, for real time, need a system time provider that just calls through to the system clock to tell the production code what the time actually is, rather than uh, relying on adjustable time provider. So, uh, I'm going to try and do a live demo of a discrete event simulation now, so I'm probably going to need to blow the text up a lot, but we'll see how it goes. So, uh, we're going to have a look at the physical queue example that we had earlier. Let me just make that a bit bigger. Um, so, this is a model of people joining and leaving a physical queue. So, they're trying to get to a counter and be served and then leave. So, our main method creates a simulation and runs it. When we create a simulation, uh, we might want to run a real-time simulation or a discrete event simulation. If we're running a real-time simulation, uh, can you guys see that okay? Yeah, okay. If we're running a real-time simulation, we'll need uh, a UTC time provider, so that just calls through to the system clock. Uh, uh, if we're running a discrete event simulation, we'll need an adjustable time provider. Uh, in real time, we'll need an executor event scheduler, and in discrete event simulation, we'll need a simple discrete event scheduler. So that's just creating one of two modes. We want to seed our random number generator so that the uh, application is deterministic, and create our physical queue. Uh, and then when we run the system, uh, we schedule an event to add to the queue. So this is executing it immediately. That's just to get away into the discrete event scheduler. Uh, adding to the queue then, we'll create a new person and have them join the queue. 
so we'll have a look at what that does in a second. Uh, what this function also does then is if we've generated enough people, it'll stop the queue when the queue is emptied. Uh, if we haven't generated enough people yet, uh, we'll do another event, which is to add to the queue again in a random amount of time. Uh, so each time someone is added to the queue, we'll execute another, or we'll schedule another event to add to the queue again for a random delay. So this is effectively a recursive callback, but via the event scheduler. So they'll happen up to a second apart each time. Uh, so it's effectively just a recursive loop here. So if we have a look at what happens when people join the queue. Okay, uh, so when someone joins the queue, uh, we add them to an actual linked list queue there. Uh, and if, ooh, if, they, if the queue has now got only one person in, that means that someone joined an empty queue, so we should serve them. Uh, so we have a look at what happens when we serve someone at a queue. Uh, that schedules an event for between 400 and 500 milliseconds time for that person to leave the queue. So that's effectively simulating them taking some amount of time to uh, be handled at the counter, so for them to be served. Uh, when they leave the queue, we just pull them off the queue there. And if the queue is not empty, that means we've got more people to serve, so we call back into serve. So that's effectively another uh, recursive callback. Uh, so we've got a, effectively a loop going on here but again via the scheduler, so that's simulating some delay between these events. Uh, and finally, if, we've, uh, if we are now empty and we're supposed to stop, then we stop the event scheduler, so that will end the simulation. So if we have a look at what that might do in real time, let me just blow up the output. So if we run a real time simulation, uh, then we're going to get these events happening half a second apart. Uh, we can see, hopefully, people joining the queue, people leaving the queue. We can see the queue sizes go up and down. Uh, so that's a real-time simulation. It took, uh, it took 9,587 milliseconds until the last person joined the queue. Uh, if we run it again, it'll take a different amount of time between the first person joining and the last person joining. And that's because we're in a real-time simulation, so we don't have that determinism. Uh, even though we've seeded our random number generator, uh, things are actually taking an amount of time to execute. So we've got non-deterministic timings in our system. Uh, so this time it took 9,567, which is possibly different to the number I just said. And then, uh, so we should do exactly the same thing, but obviously it takes a lot quicker. So that's a discrete event simulation run to the end. Uh, we simulated a total of 10 seconds and 486 milliseconds. And if I run it again, it should take the exact same amount of time to run to completion uh, and the exact same uh, timings of each person joining and leaving the queue. So that's the deterministic nature of our discrete event simulation. And just to show the faster than real time nature a bit better, if I throw 10,000 people at the queue rather than 20, uh, it'll generate some stupid amount of logging output. And there we go. Uh, so we've now run one hour and 23 minutes of uh, simulated joining and leaving of the queue, which took very little time at all. Uh, and obviously that wouldn't be feasible within the time that I've got for the talk to demonstrate in real time, so we won't look at that. Uh, but that's just showing you how much faster we can write a discrete event simulation than a real time simulation. So if you flick back to the slides then. So the interesting bit about discrete event simulations isn't like the example that I just showed. So the example that I just showed was just pure simulation. It was just simulated people joining and leaving a queue. The interesting bit is where we start running a production application against a discrete event simulation. Uh, so to do this, uh, we're going to need to do the same sorts of things as we did to write the simulation code itself, but in the production application. So we do need to alter the production code in order to run a discrete event simulation. Uh, so we need to use the event scheduler and time provider interfaces for anything in your product production code that needs to schedule events or look at the current time. Uh, and the same rules apply to make it run deterministically. So your simulation has to uh, have deterministic iterations orders. Your production code also has to have deterministic iteration orders and seed its randoms and things like that. The other thing we need to do is to override the network interface. 
Uh, so if we've separated our network interface well, we should be able to pass in a different implementation of our network interface, but instead of actually doing uh, network calls, it just directly calls into our simulation. Uh, so it might look a bit like that. So we've got a simulation wrapper that actually contains the production code, and we've overridden its network interface. And I'm going to try and do another demo now, but of a production controller and a discrete event simulation. Um, so if we just go back to the conveyor example that we looked at in the visualization earlier, uh, but on a much simpler topology. So this is our conveyor structure here. Uh, we've got a point at which conveyors, uh, sorry, containers arrive on the conveyor on the left there. Then they move along the conveyor to this diverter. At each diverter, we can send it in one of two directions. So we can send it to this exit point uh, from this diverter or this next diverter. And from this diverter, we can send it to one of two exit points. Um, so let's have a look at what we might do to run a production controller. Actually, one thing I'll say just before we move on. So the thing that the production system would be doing is controlling the decisions of where we're diverting the containers. So it's effectively going to be controlling what we do at these diverters, whereas the simulation aspect is just the physical components of the conveyors. So uh, we're going to have a slightly more complicated simulation, but uh, basically we've got a main method where we create the simulation again and run it. When we create the simulation, uh, this time we need to uh, create a set of containers that should arrive at that upstream location. Uh, we need to create our scheduler, so that's just creating a discrete event simulation this time. I haven't modeled this in real time. Uh, we then need to create the simulated mechanism, so that's the simulation of the actual physical components, the simulated conveyor. And we need to construct our controller. Uh, so that's the production code that we're instantiating there. That's the bit that will actually uh, do the logic around where to send containers as they arrive at diverters. Um, so if we have a look at what happens when we run the simulation then, uh, we call into the scheduler to start the mechanism. When we start the mechanism, we just start the container spawn location, which is that upstream location that will be spawning containers into our simulation. And when we start the container spawn location, we say that a container has arrived. And this actually broadcasts a container arrived notification to our production system. So this is our simulated component that's dosing containers into the simulation, telling the production code this container has now arrived. Uh, we're using a Guava event bus to do that transport mechanism, but you could equally just pass in an interface that it calls through to. Uh, if we have a look at what the production code might do then when a container arrived notification is received, uh, if we go over to our random planner. So, let me just hide that again. So when a container arrives, when the production code hears that a container arrives, it needs to decide where to send it. Um, so this one simply looks at the places that it could send it from the first diverter and chooses one at random, and then sends a container routing instruction. So that's the production API that goes from the controller code down to the, in, in, uh, in a real situation, that would go down to the physical conveyor to tell it exactly what to do. Uh, in our simulation, that's going to be routed to our, uh, our simulated piece of conveyor, uh, but using the production API, but without the network interface. Uh, so another thing that this does, if we happened to choose to send it from the first diverter to the second diverter, we need to decide what happens when it gets to the second diverter as well. Uh, and here again, we just simply pick at random one of the places that that second diverter could send it, uh, and send another container routing instruction down. So this then goes back into simulation code. So if we have a look at the instruction listener, so this is now a simulation of what the physical system might do. Uh, so the instruction listener will find the appropriate diverter and tell it that routing has been instructed. When routing has been instructed, we just add it to a map of routing decisions. So the container might not be there right away, so we might need to remember what the production system said we should do with that container when it arrives. Uh, and then we propose a divert. So if it is there right now, we might need to divert it. And what we do is we look up its routing decision, 
uh, and we get the downstream location for that routing decision and we tell it that we've got a container that's ready for that downstream location. And what the downstream location might do is then call into the scheduler to simulate a delay in the movement of one container to, uh, from one place to another. Uh, so this is delaying uh, the execution by a second. So it's saying it takes a second for the container to move from the diverter to the downstream location of the diverter. Uh, so that then calls back to the diverter to remove that container. Uh, so that's how the routing decisions are instructed and how they're handled in the simulation. Uh, if we have a look at what the random algorithm will do, so this is then testing the simulation using production code to control it. Uh, did that run? Yeah, that ran. Uh, so our outcome was that we've got, uh, so we've got no containers that haven't been through the system. Can we see that logging output okay? Or does that need to be a bit bigger? Let me blow that up. So we've got no containers that didn't go through the system. So it's run to completion. It's successfully put all of the containers through the conveyor and diverted them appropriately. Uh, what we have as well is a bunch of containers at the different output locations. And it took two minutes and 19 seconds for us to get to that point. Um, but it might take different amounts of time because we've got some random choice in our system. Uh, so what we might want to do is to run it with a different random seed. So this is the exact same uh, algorithm that we just used, exact same code. All that's happening now is we're seeding our random differently. So that took two minutes and 18 and 500 milliseconds. So it's half a second faster than the previous run. So there is some random noise in our system. Uh, it is deterministic though. So if I run it again, we'll get the exact same outcome. But we've increased our test coverage because we've now got a slightly different circumstances in our, in our system. We've got containers arriving at different places at different times. Uh, another thing we might want to do then is to evaluate a different control strategy. So uh, what we've got at the moment is three output locations, but our diverters are in serial. Uh, so if we're making random decisions at the first diverter, roughly half are going to exit at that first diverter, and half are going to go downstream to the second diverter. And at the second diverter, they'll then be halved again. So the first exit is going to get much more traffic than the second and third exits. Uh, what we might want to do is design a system that distributes more evenly. So don't have half of the traffic going to that first diverter uh, and, and then split the remaining half between the second two. Uh, what we might want to do is evenly distribute the work. Uh, so this could be because we've got people at those output locations and they're loading a van. And if we didn't distribute it evenly, two of them are gonna be sat there not doing very much while one of them has lots of work to do. Uh, so if we wanted to have a look at how that might work, uh, we could have an even planner uh, so this one, uh, I won't go into too much detail because I haven't got much time left about how it works, but it basically cycles. It uses uh, Guava iterators to cycle through uh, diverting once to the first exit point and then twice to the diverter, once to the first exit point, twice to the diverter, and just cycles that. And the second diverter will just alternate between outputs. Uh, so if we then run that... So uh, we can see what happened there. So this one took two minutes and 13 seconds uh, to finish. So that's actually sped up the system. It's got the containers through the conveyor slightly faster than the random approach did. And we can see from the lengths of these lists that it has actually distributed the work more evenly. Another thing we might want to do, so if we wanted to evaluate a third strategy, uh, we could have a look at this bugged algorithm which I know is bugged, but uh, it'll serve as an example. Uh, so this algorithm didn't actually finish. It's got a bunch of containers that didn't go through the system, and it threw a null pointer exception. Uh, what we can do is actually debug that null pointer exception uh, by inserting breakpoints at the point at which it fails. And we know from the logging output that uh, it was container 71 reached the diverter. So we know that that's the problem container. So we can add a breakpoint in here uh, for, go on, right click, there we are for container.id equals 71. And if we run that in debug, uh, we can see that the destination 
is actually 999 from our output down here, and our downstream locations contain one and two. So it's trying to divert the container to a place that doesn't exist. Uh, so that's the bug. Um, but what we can't do from this is find out exactly why we tried to get it to divert to that location. So what we can do now is step back to an earlier point in the execution and do a root cause analysis of why we generated that. Uh, so if you flick to container routing instruction, uh, we can breakpoint this where we divert container 71 to destination 999. And if we rerun our simulation, we can now get to that point. We know because it's deterministic, it must be the cause of our problem. So we've hit that there, and we can look up in the stack and see that this bugged implementation uh, is generating an output of 999 uh, in this case because it's got a very small random chance to do so. Uh, so, very trivial bug, but that's uh, just a flavor of how you can step back in execution to find uh, root causes of your bugs. Uh, so, I'm running out of time now, so I'm just going to flick back to the slides. So, one other thing that you can do with discrete event simulation, so we've talked about scenario testing. I haven't shown you any actual scenario tests, I've just shown you fairly contrived examples. Uh, but you can uh, inject messages into the simulation and you can listen for messages from the simulation or the production code in order to assert things about exactly how it's behaving. So you can say, when I instruct one container to be fed into the simulation, then it makes it all the way through the, con the conveyor and out the other side. Uh, so you can use that to build up tests. You can also do integration testing with discrete event simulation. So you can run multiple production applications within one uh, simulation. And you can override the network interfaces so that they speak to each other via simulated code rather than via the, the direct uh, production network interfaces that they would do normally. What this means, though, is that we don't have to simulate the application that you're testing and then everything else around it, including other bits of software. We can actually run all of the bits of software in a discrete event simulation and only simulate the physical components. And it also means that you can test that your applications work together in a repeatable way. So just going over what we found then, so uh, I said at the start that better testing and debugging capabilities speeds up development and decreases the frequency of production issues, and that better analysis and optimization results in a better system. Uh, so hopefully, I think everyone basically agreed with that anyway, but hopefully now you're convinced that discrete event simulation can help you with this. And that's it. So if you're thinking of using a discrete event simulation, uh, please let me know. So there's my uh, Twitter handle. Uh, and I'll take questions. Uh, one thing, so uh, I said at the start, but if you'd like to leave feedback for the talk, there's something over there. I'm not sure exactly what it is. And if you'd like to chat with me uh, later on, I'll be at the Ocado stand uh, downstairs. Uh, so do we have any questions? One. Yep. So take in mind, uh, I'm a web developer. Mm -hmm. Which kind of system is subjected to get benefits? Yeah. So. So this, so we use it a lot for warehouse control systems. Uh, for, for things that are interacting mainly with physical components rather than users, it's a lot easier to, uh, to do that sort of thing. Also for things with fewer network interfaces, it's a lot easier to do a discrete event simulation. You could use it for things like web services though, because you can mock out the actual uh, networking part of the web service and test its inner functionality. Uh, so web services you can test quite a lot of. Websites. All of the front end is going to be very hard to build a discrete event simulation around that because the network uh, link is fairly vital to the whole process. Uh, so yeah, it's very suited to control systems, uh, very suited to sort of back end logic, things that where you want to test uh, calculations in the back end, less suited to things that are more um, more website focused, more network uh, intensive. Am I right to say that what you are speeding up is the, the mechanism time and the time that and the speed time also? Sorry? What? The, the optimization of the yep. discrete event simulation yep. is that you save the time that the machines need to do something. Yeah, so, so the reason that discrete event simulations are faster than uh, the amount of time that they're simulating is that we're jumping, the, we're jumping time. So we're skipping over points where the production code would just be sleeping. So if we say, I need to... Uh, I need to send a divert decision in five seconds. We don't wait for five seconds. We set the time to five seconds time and then execute it straight away. So that's why it's faster. Um, but then in terms of 
optimizing using discrete event uh, simulation to optimize production code. That's more. Um, this is just a deterministic way of testing it. So to optimize the production code to actually function better is uh, just a sort of byproduct of, of a discrete event simulation. So, yeah, so um, we, in the very trivial example that we went through there, we saw a simulation of uh, it taking some amount of time for the conveyor to yeah. move a container from one place to another. Um, but you can do much more complex things like that. So if, for example, your physical device reports exactly where your container is every 10 milliseconds, you can schedule that event to actually report where the container is every 10 milliseconds. Uh, so, um, you can do sort of more fine-grained detail things than that. Uh, so we've got other things that actually simulate physics in terms of um, kinematic equations, so how things speed up and slow down and how they report at different points along that. Um, so yeah, you, you can model, uh, if it's a physical device, you should be able to model basically any property of it 